why does SETI continue to be funded where you're really <coughs> demonstrating like you can do all this with the, with the protocol? Like, right. I mean, it's out there for people to just go and get the app and... And do it. Well, yeah, it doesn't matter what kind of evidence you put together or even signals we get or images. Um, the subject, again, gets debunked. Um, but the other thing about the, the, the SETI project, it, like Seth Shostak and these people, they are carrying water for someone. Because you're either a blithering, you're either stupid or you're corrupt. There's two things to choose from here. If you really d dug into this and you're at that level uh, at NASA or the SETI project, um, and I debated Seth Shostak on Voice of America about this. I had my military witnesses, John Callahan, who had all the radar tapes, and we basically cleaned his clock. But at a certain point, I said, you cannot look at all this dispositive evidence and proof and information and just dismiss it um, while you sit there and spend hundreds of millions of dollars saying you're listening from a signal from outer space, which, by the way, they've already received and been covered up. Um, now, I'm going to say something here because this is enough years after it happened. Um, a few years ago, there was a show called um, Coast to Coast with Art Bell. And it was on the cover of Time magazine, and I was one of his favorite guests. And um, when I'd be on that show, it, a, it really lit things up at certain agencies. And one time I was on his show, and a few years back, uh, towards the end of his career there, and this issue came up, and I said, well, you know, I have a source high up in SETI that confirms to me that they, in fact, have received inter interplanetary signals, but in a kind of phased, not normal array. It was kind of a pulsed um, array, and that it was kept secret and covered up. And um, the SETI people were furious. Subsequently, Seth Shostak got on the show and just said, well, Dr. Greer knew what he's talking about, and he probably talked to some volunteer computer operator, because we have all this network of volunteers. What Art Bell didn't know, and which Seth Shostak didn't know, and which I'm going to say now, because it's enough water gone under the bridge, is that um, the guy who told me that was the founder of the SETI project. Uh, and, and the Drake equation, Dr. Drake. He told me that, that they had had that contact. Moreover, a man who had been one of Carl Sagan's best friends, the best man at his wedding, um, confirmed it. And he had been present when the wow signal came in at Harvard. Um, so, you know, it's very frustrating for me because, you know, these, pe th these are people who, one of them was an astronomer who was actually at the Georgetown Weston Hotel in 1997 when we were doing briefings for Congress, but his presence there resulted in him being in contact, because he used to be the editor of Sky and Telescope magazine and Astronomy magazine and had worked with uh, Carl Sagan, all these people. And he said, he contacted my wife and me after that, and he says, you know, I've been told that if I don't back off of this, I will never have a working position again. And I got kids in college. So he, wonderful man, wished us all the best and left. So that's how it works. And, you know, I mean, I gave up my medical career. I mean, people say, oh my God, you know, I say I gave up 500 and some thousand dollars a year to be doing this for nada. But most people who are in a situation like that, who's an academic, and what have you, unless they're independently wealthy, they really can't turn to the people who are hiring them as an editor or a professor and say, bug off. Um, and so this, this brilliant scientist who had all this information, who started to come out, he never went public, but he, at the meeting with the members of Congress and these other initial witnesses we had in 97, when I was still trying to get the White House and Congress to do disclosure, so I wouldn't have to do it in 2001, right before 9-11. Those, the, he was at that meeting. But even being kind of out on this subject that much caused him to be contacted and be told, don't, stop it, or your career is over.
He says, and he was, it was made very clear to him, you will never work again. No one will hire you. So, you know, there are a lot of people like that. And, and so there is this, um, it's not so much some sort of Illuminati, it's this, this oppressive um, condemnation of the subject along with abuse of power, you know. I mean, it's quite illegal for the CIA to be infiltrating an alleged independent Air Force investigation at the University of Colorado and put someone on their payroll to prejudice the jury and kill the report on this subject in 1969, whenever that happened, when the CIA is barred from having any domestic uh, activities. I mean, this is illegal. Go read the law. And it's also, however, why I've told people this is why everything we're doing is legal. Very different from, say, Edward Snowden, who was disclosing information that the president knew about and certain members of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence knew about and the House Intelligence Committee knew about. The stuff I'm s disclosing are things that the president is being lied to. The head of intelligence joint staff who I briefed, Admiral Wilson, was lied to. The head of the Defense Intelligence Agency was lied to. A sitting CIA director was lied to. Chairman of key committees that I met with, senators and House, were lied to. I can prove that in a court of law. A priori, those projects are illegal, and I have declared them rogue and illegal, and therefore they cannot touch us. Um, and that's the difference. Oh, I want to make this a very clear point. There's a big difference between disclosing something that's being kept secret, even if it's wrong. I'm not saying that what Snowden disclosed was right or wrong. He probably did a service in the, in the, in the long run. But, but that was being overseen by the appropriate governmental elected and appointed officials. And something like this that has no constitutional oversight and is a complete criminal operation and rogue. That, and this is why you know, Danny Sheehan, who worked with me right before Disclosure Project, he and I discussed this. And he's a constitutional attorney who did the Silkwood case and the Pentagon Papers representing the New York Times. And, the, and he said, look, you know, given the people you've met with, and the fact that they've been denied access, who are at the top of the heap, not only in the United States, but people like that I've met with in Great Britain, France, other places where they're completely being left out. That is prima facie evidence of an illegal operation. And therefore, if it's an illegal operation, it, they can't cite the rule of law to protect themselves. Which is why our position was, in the late 90s, early 2000s, Anyone with documents, information, whatever about this, you can come forward with, without any penalty of violating your national security oath. Now, saying it and having people do it because they're afraid. You know, people have been threatened with death. People have been, but we did get enough people to come forward um, because we had a critical mass. You know, I didn't come forward with one or two. I came forward with dozens all at once. So that was that was the the, the power of unity and the power of doing it. We really need to have another wave of that happen from people who are currently in government and not just retired people. But the closer someone is to central operations at Lockheed Skunk Works or the agency or the NSA who know about this, and the closer in time they're related to it, the more afraid they are of tweep, like terminate with extreme prejudice, which is the euphemism for what this guy at the CIA has told me, they call it wet works. Wet meaning blood, a wet works tweet. So, yeah, nice. Well, welcome to my world. I live and breathe. Um, and, and that's why a lot of these people are very afraid if they're really currently in current operations. It's not that they don't understand the legal principle I just articulated. Uh, in other countries, it's, it's a minor version of the same thing. So, say in France, you have friendly people, just like there are here, very interested in actually trying to do something, but then there'll be others who are in a compartmented operation tied into this international group that maintains secrecy, and at a certain point they will be threatened. And that's what happened. We started, we, we actually had, I was contacted by these people in France and said, you know, an official in the United States contacted the um, ambassador. Uh, from France to the United States and said, what the hell do you think you're doing? After I got 
this document from the Ministry of Defense and this big outline of all the studies they wanted to do at post contact, biological, technological, the whole bit. It's this amazing document I have. And <laughs> I say, it's like, it's like, curl your hair. What little hair I have left would be curled. But when I read it, I went, wow, I can't believe I got this from the sitting government. But they got contacted, and, and basically they came to some kind of a truce where they said, well, you can do this with Dr. Greer so long as you stay on French soil. Do not try to do it anywhere else. They said, fine, fine, fine. So that's why we did it there. 